It goes from very low activity or few of these spots that we see on the disk to suddenly just covered with spots and many different places where activity could come from. Um, those, that, that activity you talked about coming towards us, um, we're just at the time of, of the sun cycle that there's going to be a lot of it. And how does that impact what happens here on Earth? So it, the first impact is actually beautiful. You're able to see the aurora um, normally at more latitudes than you normally can. Uh, so that's one of the great benefits. But due to our dependence on our technology, um, we have some issues with all of that other energy coming towards us. As it comes and interacts with our atmosphere, it can affect our power grids. And those long lines that you see um, for power grids can actually um, overheat and cause blackouts or things like that. And so we we need to understand where they're coming so we're able to prepare ourselves for that. There's also issues with satellite communications. Um, parts of our atmosphere um, basically collapse or get so dense that those radio waves that are sent from satellites to your GPS um, don't make it all the way through uh, or get a little skewed as they do make it through the atmosphere. Um, so we need to be able to account for that as well. So how do we prepare then? So governments and companies all over the world are preparing for this, and we make sure to do uh, research like we do at NASA um, to better understand what the sun is doing and how that and uh, how that affects it. And then we have folks who do the actual forecasting and tell us um, what the next week or so or a couple of days are going to look like in terms of space weather. Um, and when there's an incoming flare or coronal mass ejection, um, folks are able to uh, adjust how the power grid usage works so that we have less energy or less pressure on one, one part of the system. We can also use alternate communications if we know um, that one communication channel is going to be blocked. So there's a gap, a time lag, if you like, between the, the solar event and the time that it'll affect things on Earth. Yes, the sun's 93 million miles away. So light, the fastest thing that can travel, takes eight minutes. And those other particles, even though they're really energetic, um, they're going to take a couple of days to get here. Um, so we've got a couple of days um, to understand what's going to happen and prepare ourselves. And um, this is due to last a year or two? Yeah, so the solar maximum phase um, is going to last a year or so, um, and then there's a declining phase as well. Um, so it'll be a few months up at the top and then a steady decline in activity. But even during that decline is actually when we've seen some of the, um, some of the bigger storms mm. in our lifetime. And what have been the largest solar flares or, or storms in the past then that we've been able to document and seen the effect that it's had here? Right. We, we saw some in October as well as May of this year. Um, we've seen some also in 1989, in uh, 2003. Uh, there was also the Carrington event in 1859. And now technology was a little bit different back in 1859. Um, we had telegraphs as, as our way to communicate. But those telegraph wires caught on fire. And other wires that survived were able to run without, battery, without any battery powers for a while because of all the energy it just stored up. Um, and then there was a rural all the way down to Hawaii uh, from the north. So that was a really big event. Mm. So despite all the, the problems that this might cause, as an astrophysicist and a program scientist uh, at NASA, Kelly, you must be pretty excited about uh, what's happening. This is an exciting time. Um, it's very exciting to see the sun so active and to see it interact with us and that thing 93 million miles away affect our everyday lives. Um, and it just gives us so much more information about this star and how we live with it and other stars and other uh, solar systems as well.